afternoon session for the World Conference. Uh, our next presentation is on performance graphing and trending best practices. Our presenter is Matt Wall, and he is a mechanical engineer out of Boston, and he has been uh, hacking away at Nagios Graph for about the last two years. So let's give a Matt Wall a hand. Still, st there we go. All right. Um, as Mike said, um, my name is Matthew Wall, uh, here from Boston. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to go over, then give you some background on before I dive into things. Um, I'm going to talk about why graphing and trending is an issue, um, talk a little bit more after that about what a, a nice trending system really should do, then go into some of the parts of that, what that means with respect to Nagios in particular. We're going to go over some of the options that are out there right now that you can actually play with and install on your own systems. And then go over some of the best practices. What are the issues that are involved? What are some things you can do up front to save yourself some pain later on? So for context on this, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I, I design aircraft engines in my, as my day job, basically. Um, I use evolutionary algorithms to solve some pretty nasty engineering problems. Um, but in doing that, we deal with a lot of computer systems. We have massively parallel algorithms that go out to tons of different machines and go chewing away on things. So we have to monitor those machines. And uh, I do this at some large companies monitoring hundreds of computers. I also do this at some other installations. There's a, um, an aircraft manufacturer in the Boston area that I do some consulting for. They um, have a few servers in a closet bunch of workstations their engineers use. Um, also done some work with my brother, keeping some databases online for a certain BS pop star to do the ticketing systems for her concerts and so forth. Um, I also do uh, some monitoring of some real systems on an island off the coast of Maine. It's actually a lighthouse, and I'd be happy to talk about that with some people, about water levels, pressure levels, solar system, heating water, um, septic system, and all that kind of thing. So when I get it, my background on all this Nagio stuff is kind of the low end. It's, uh, we do a lot of the hacking ourselves. We often have people with expert skills setting the things up, but then have to turn that over to people who have no idea what's going on. They just need to see the blinking lights and maybe the pictures to tell them what's going on. Um, basically, we have no budget for any of these things. So everything we do on a shoestring, whatever we can pull together, um, that doesn't sound common, does it? Um, and there's a pretty high hack factor on getting things set up for us. Um, it's okay if things don't work right out of the box. We've got people around who can get it to work and go on from there. So that's the context for this. So right up front, I'm going to tell you some of the options I'll be talking about. I'm going to come back to this later on. The four on the left are integrated within Nagios itself. The th the two on the right, you can do some integration, but they're more standalone tools. I'm going to be dealing more with the types of tools that you see on the left side of this rather than the ones on the right. But we'll touch on all these so you have a, a feeling for what you can do. So why is this a problem? Why is graphing and trending an issue? Nagios does a great job of indicating current status. It tells you what's going on right now, what's up, what's down. But when you look at the trending built into at least Nagios core, trending consists of well, this is when we had failures, and this is when we didn't. It doesn't tell you anything about the performance data from those things. It just tells you what's up and what's down. Now, that's different from Nagios XI. It's got some graphing. It's got PMP for Nagios built into it. Um, but Nagios core trending doesn't tell you anything about performance data. How hot did things get? How, um, what were the actual levels involved? It's just an on-off kind of thing. What were the warning critical the states? So. This is actually a problem because, like, if you're just going into a new environment and setting things up, you've got to figure out what notifications actually matter and which ones don't. And um, it's also helpful to know what's happening in between the notifications. You know, what happens when you close the refrigerator door? Did the light really go off? What's going on below your thresholds? Um, it, for going back in time and looking at what caused the disasters, it's very useful. Are there correlations between different things? Did a bunch of things go off at the same time? And it's, that information then is in turn useful for predicting 
future disasters and fending them off before they happen. So I'll give you a couple examples here to show what I mean. Um, one of them has to do with temperature monitoring. This is really what got me onto Nagios in the first place. With all the systems that I've been monitoring, whether it's for clients or at some of the larger companies I work with, uh, power has always been an issue, and we've got everything on ups because we can't data, our data is really important, so we've got everything on ups to try to recover and make it through dirty power and all that kind of thing. But uh, I've had batteries burst into flames because either the battery was going bad or the controller was going bad or we've had really dirty power, and so the voltages were just way too high for the power supply, things like that. So I've actually had things catching on fire. And after that burning up some computer systems, we decided it's time to put some monitoring on there so that we can catch this stuff before it comes a, becomes a problem. So from my point of view, all the network monitoring and that kind of stuff, that's nice, but it's been the physical systems that have been more important and driving me more in this. So I'll show you a couple examples here. Uh, this is at that aircraft manufacturer in the Boston area. Um, they've got a small server closet, not too many machines in there, I don't know, maybe 10 or something like that, some racks, some Dell 2900 series stuff, but it gets warm. There's air conditioning in there to try to balance it out, but we got this uh, right here. There was a, a warning that went off there, and that kind of tipped us off to something's going on there. We looked back at these graphs, and we saw these spikes. Well, not spikes. These are actually, they're actually an exponential curve and thermal warming curves. So one day, every day, get these pumps on weekdays, and then on the weekends, there's nothing. It's nice and flat, and then in the next week, it starts up again. And if you look, so these plots are from three different UPSs attached to three different machines in that server closet. The first two are actually well below the thresholds. The bottom one's up a bit higher. So we wouldn't even have caught this had the not other one been running warm. Turns out that there's an engineer that sits near that closet. When he would come to work in the morning, every day the first thing he would do would be to close his door. Well, it turns out that the air conditioning sucks a lot of air through his door <laughs> in order to get into the server room. and <laughs> That was block constricting the airflow enough to drop to let the temperatures go up in that server room. So, how <laughs> how would you ever figure that out? So, they did some duct work. Now they got nice ventilation. No problem with these temperatures going up. It's nice and flat all the time now. But we never. I mean, that that one alarm going off, we would have no idea what was going on with that if we hadn't didn't have this trend data to give us let us see a pattern here and then make the correlation, oh, it's on weekdays, and Bill, who's sitting next to the room, comes in at those times. That's what it is. Another one, they, they monitor software licensing there using Nagios. Um, so they've always wanted to know, well, how often are our own people using the licenses for the software that we've got? Do we have too many licenses? Can we get away with paying for half as many licenses? This is, in, is for SolidWorks. It's a solid modeling software and some of the related add-ons to that, which are some finite element codes and such. So using Nagios on this, we can actually see what the profiles are. And here, once again, you can see the daily spikes. It's really fuzzy. Um, you can see the daily spikes when people come into the office and start using the software. And you can see um, in two cases, the first and third case, they're not even close to the license limits. They could actually cut in half the number of software licenses they've got and still be fine. Whereas with the second one, they're closer to the license limits there. So knowing what's going on under your thresholds really matters. It helps you make decisions. And knowing how those thresholds change in time matters too. Here's another example from, this is just a disk off of a, a video server in one of these installations. The, we started out with thresholds that are right up the top near the, the top of the disk capacity. And at one point in time, those thresholds were dropped a bit just to give us a more comfort zone. The f at first, when they were going off, it was like the disk is full and that's it. We had no buffer in which to deal with the issues. But the important point of this is, especially when you are dealing with management teams or making decisions, it's not good enough just to know what your data are. You need to know how and how those data change in time. You also need to know how your requirements change in time. If your thresholds have changed, from the last time you did your measurements. You need to know that, because that affects the decisions you make later on. So keep track of your thresholds, not just your data. And another example, more dynamic environments. This is a, a set of network uh, throughput. This is a network throughput graph for a, a data zero. So that was the, basically a file server on this network. This is another client that has, they do a lot of distributed continuous build systems using Hudson. They've got about between 30 and 50 
virtual machines that fire up and then spin down, fire up and spin down as Hudson spawns them to do their builds. It's a cross-platform C++ development tool that they have and they need to fire up these environments, do the compile, run all the unit tests, and then shut them back down. So we were looking at this to try to figure out if we needed to beef up our trunk, uh, the network trunk, you know, more bandwidth and so forth. And we were seeing some spikes, um, which corresponds to the virtual machines spinning up and spinning down, but we couldn't tell which ones they were and which ones were um, driving the extra data use on the network. So in particular, we were wondering about that one interval. Now we had other Nagios graphs that show the uptime or the connectivity of these virtual machines. Here's two of them, and based on these pings, it's really hard to see with that display doing what it's doing. But um, they're up for like a, a half an hour window and then they shut down. So the key here to help us figure out what was going on is to be able to take those connectivity plots and map them onto the network plot. Now, nothing does that right now in Nagios. And that's actually one of the things I'm working on now in Nagios Graph to make it do that. Take some arbitrary string of data and map it onto another so you can see if there's patterns and correlations. So the point of all this is trending is not just about drawing graphs. It's, try, it's giving you a way to catch disasters before they come, become disasters. Um, it's a, a way to uh, do comparisons between different things, you know, one server compared to another server, see if there's correlations, or one service check against another service check to see if they have a spike at the same time, or comparisons in time. For a given host, do we see the same, same pattern? If so, how does that pattern change from month to month? What are the, the levels as it changes? These are the things that you need a training system to do. And I'll, so I'm going to go a little more detail into what I think the requirements are for a good training system. One of them is keeping track of the, the thresholds as well as your data, as I mentioned before. Another thing, you should be able to say, for a specific host, show me all the services that are on that thing. And you shouldn't have to go and configure it to do that. It should just do that automatically for you. Another perspective on that is, I have this service. Show me what this service like looks like across every host that has that service. You should just do that out of the box. You shouldn't have to configure it to do that. Another way it should, thing it should do is let you put together arbitrary combinations of those things. These three hosts and these two services and these other two services from these hosts, I want them in a single view because those are the things that matter to me for the next month and that's what I need to just take a look at to see what's going on. So you need, an ar you need to be able to arbitrarily group these host and service checks. And it shouldn't kill you to do that. It should be pretty straightforward. And you should be able to do some interactive querying on that. Changing the time frame, right? Your, your canned reports might say, okay, I'm gonna look at the last week, the last month, the last year. But sometimes you need to do more interactive things, like zoom in on a certain period, or say, I'm going to look at the last two years instead of the last year to see what's going on. All of the tools out there fall flat on this as well. I mean, they do some of it to some extent, but um, they still fall short. There's two, so this is my summary of what I think a trending tool should do for you. There's two in particular themes that, about the comparison they just aren't out there yet. Nobody does that. As far as I know, if, if somebody knows of something that does that, let me know. Um, at least not, not Nagios-based. And of course, the last three are important. Got to be easy to use. It's got to be easy on the eyes. None of this black on white kind of, well, you know, it's, it, if you don't like the way it looks, you should be able to customize it so it looks reasonable to you. And uh, it's got to be easy to configure and manage. Um, I also wrote the exfoliation stuff, so um, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Um, so what does this mean in Nagios itself? What are the bits, what are the moving parts in Nagios when we talk about trending and graphing? Well, there's three parts. There's data collection, data storage, and the data display. Some of the, p the packages, the add-ons that you'll see out there try to do all three of them. Some of them do it like spaghetti, some do it like meatballs. The spaghetti ones, it's just like all twisted together and you can't pull it into pieces. The smarter ones do it like meatballs. They've got one meatball for the collection, one meatball for the storage, and one for the display, so you can pick the meatballs you want instead of pulling a strand of spaghetti and having the whole thing fall apart, okay? 
But these are the fundamental components to any trending system you're going to see in Nagios. So let's break this down. I'm going to give you, in the left side of these, you'll see the diagram from a Nagios graph point of view. But the other tools have similar components. They may not be identical, but it's a similar pattern. So the first part, data collection. In Nagios, there's, there's three basic ways, maybe four ways of doing that. You can go immediate mode, batch, and uh, shared library, or an external process. Batch is probably the most common, especially for smaller installations. When you get into bigger things, you need to go with the shared library. I'm not going to dive too much into these details. I can talk to you about it later or read a lot of the documentation, either in Nagios Graph or PMP for Nagios. They both have it documented pretty well in there. But the point is, Nagio of this is Nagios is the master of this whole thing. It, at some point, it, it emits data to this perf data log file, which is then picked up. Then periodically, Nagios calls out to, in, in Nagios Graph, it's called insert.pl, this other script that then reads the perf data file, parses it, and then does something with it. So in every case, Nagios is in charge of the collection. And that means that you need to make sure that that whole collection activity happens in short enough time that it doesn't bog down your Nagios server. If your collection or your, your processing of that collection data is taking significantly longer than some of your checks, then you're going to start missing your check data, those check intervals. So, but that's the responsibility of the glue writer, whoever wrote Nagios Graph or PMP for Nagios. That's their responsibility to take care of. You don't need to worry about that. The next step is, um, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Um, these are just examples of what these things look like. In the perf data log file, so what this means is there's a configuration file for Nagios, the commands.cfg, that you have to put a couple of uh, configuration options in there to tell it to emit the, perf the performance data to file. It starts emitting this perf data log, which just contains the information for each check that it's done. And then you need your, your collection tool, in this case, Nagios, a Nagios graph, the insert.pl script. It has a map file, which is Perl, which just does pattern matching, snarfs that stuff up out of the perf data file, and then stuffs it off to the data storage system. The other systems have a similar kind of mechanism. It's, the pieces are not that much different between these different systems. There are issues involved with all of these. Your sampling interval, your sampling uh, precision, what kind of data are coming back, making sure your units are right, um, all of that kind of thing. <laughs> Even the question of whether or not Nagios is a tool you should be using to do your data collection. I'm going to come back to that toward the end, because that's actually an important question. It may not be the right thing for doing your performance data check, your performance trending. Um, so I'm going to whiz through this a little bit, because there's a lot to cover here. Um, the next step is the data storage. And I'll, I'll try to leave some time at the end for any questions, if you do have any more detailed questions on any of these pieces. But ideally, your tool is going to take care of all these, this level of things for you, so you don't have to worry about this. But you should know what is involved here, because that can affect how, which tool you choose. The next part is the data storage part. All these tools use RD tool, and it's quite well suited to this task. Um, if nothing else, just because you know how it's going to scale. It's not going to get balloon on you if you forgot to write a log rotate or, or some equivalent for parsing your, or pruning down your databases. So they use RD tool, and RD tool is very straightforward. You know, you say, here's my data, and it stuffs it into a file. Your file is a certain size. They never grow. Um, the RD tool update looks something like that in that first little bo gray box. The, it dumps everything out to just plain files. So if you want to do the equivalent of uh, dumping your or, um, database, just delete the file. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, if, if you want to look in the contents of the files, RD tool contains commands to do that. You can dump it as XML, CSV, you can get right into the data. You can modify it if you need to. Pretty straightforward data storage system. But there are issues. It's RD tool has a schema definition, just like any SQL or any other database does. And so you need to make sure that you don't start trashing your schemas or trying to combine schemas that don't fit together. Um, redundancy and backup are pretty straightforward since it's file-based. Um, you can use rsync, for example. And a lot of very simple systems for backing things up. Uh, as far as the data display goes, my personal preference is CGI-based. 
even though that sounds like I'm living 20 years ago, but or when was it, 10 years ago, however long it was, back in the 90s. <laughs> um, it's uh, simple, easy to debug, and you can build on it. You can use those CGI's in your PHP or whatever else you want to deliver at the end of things. Um, most of these tools do have a CGI component. Nagios Graph is purely CGI based. Um, PMP for Nagios is a combination of PHP and CGI and uh, N2RD, well the, the RRD to graph part of it is CGI based as well. And that's straightforward. You just have RRD files, you suck the data out of them, your CGI script then wraps some HTML around it and sends it off to the client through your web browser. And with that, you can do all these nice things like having the, the summary graphs pop up as you mouse over your little graph icons in your status view in Nagios. Or the more detailed graphs that you get in your various reports. If you've got an, a solid CGI underpinning, you can do all that stuff very straightforward. It's very straightforward to do all those other things on top of it. Um, so that's the basic process there on the left. That's what happens behind the curtain. And these tools, the, the tools there, the four tools in the middle are all follow that basic pattern. Now I've listed a few Nagios Graph. I know most about that because I've been hacking on it for the last two years. Um, Nagios Grapher, not to be confused with Nagios Graph. Na Nagios Graph was first released in 2004. Nagios Grapher came out after that. It's pretty much dead as far as I can tell. If anybody knows differently, let me know. It's still, unfortunately, Nagios Grapher is still in most of the Linux distributions and it confuses everybody. It's not Nagios Graph. Nagios Graph hasn't been in any Linux distribution until next year, probably. We only dropped the RPMs and devs for it this year. So don't use Nagios Graph, Nagios Grapher thinking you're using Nagios Graph. Um, there is, I think it's OpsView, no. Somebody is, th there is a Nagios Grapher version too, but it's Flash based, okay? So it's not at all the same thing as Nagios Graph. N2RD and R2D, that is still in active development. That's probably the simplest of all these. It's the most bare bones. If you really want to just start with something simple and take a look at it and play, you can do that. Uh, PMP for Nagios is, is very, is probably the most comprehensive of all these. They've got a lot more different ways for collecting the data. They probably scale better, too, for some really large systems. If your Nagios server is already overloaded, PMP for Nagios might be a better way to go, or you might want to take that one little piece from PMP for Nagios that makes it that way and put that in with Nagios Graph and then use Nagios Graph. It, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, you can actually grab pieces from each of these and mix and match if you have to, to some extent. Um, and there's also differences in look and feel, which you'll see a little bit as I go into detail on these. Cacti and MRTG are separate. Cacti, and there, there's people here who know a lot more about cacti than I do, so I don't want to do it any injustice by not giving you the detailed information on that. It can be a standalone system or it can be integrated with Nagios. Um, MRTG is more bare bones. Um, so cacti's got its own interface you can use for either collecting or for graphing, or if you can just take the graphing part of cacti. You can actually take the collection part from Nagios Graph and the graphing part from cacti and smash those together directly into Nagios and have a nice working system. In fact, there's a, um, it works. And, or you can use cacti to do your collecting and trending completely on its own. And there are actually some arguments for doing that in some cases. Um, one of the things I'll touch on later is that Nagios, Nagios was, um, I'll come back to that. Um, MRTG is more bare bones than cacti. Um, if you just like to get in and hack, it's a good place to start to understand RD tool. I can't highly recommend it for any, well, yeah, it's, it's much more primitive. Fewer JavaScript controls, fewer interactive kinds of things to use with that. Um, but it's a good way to learn RD tool and RD graph. So N to RD and RD to graph, those are the two pieces. One is the collection part, N to RD, just the Perl script. And RD to graph is the CGI, it's another Perl script. Very simple system. It generates some nice reports. Those are some examples of its, the gray one is the um, different time periods displayed and the 
the one behind that is show me all the services for a single host view for N2RD. Um, I'm sorry this thing is jiggling so much. You'll get, you'll get an electronic copy of this afterwards and you can look at this in detail instead of, so. PMP for Nagios has got a PHP front end to it. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is in the configuration of these things, PMP for Nagios and N2RD are both template based. You define a host service template for, you define a template for every host service pair and it does matching to figure out which templates it should use to draw, to collect the data and to display the data. So remember there's two important parts, there's the collection and the display. So it uses templates for both the collection and for the display. Nagios Graph, on the other hand, is parameterized. So it does pattern matching on your host names and your services and uses those and a combination of parameters in a configuration file to figure out how it should handle the data and how it should display the graphs. Um, leads to some, in, in, in the template-based ones, you end up with a bunch of individual files that have kind of like this, a service check definition in Nagios, you know, those are just a, those blocks. Whereas in, a, in the parameterized uh, configurations, you tend to have a configuration file that says, here's a parameter name, and here's the, you'll have a, a configuration name, and then you'll have a, um, uh, the, the pattern you want it to match to, and then the specifics of what you want in it. So basically, it's kind of like taking a temp, well, yeah. Examples would help, and we can come back to that if you really need to, to see the differences of that. Um, more to say on that later. Nagios Graph, uh, this is a shot of zooming within um, Nagios itself with Nagios Graph embedded into the, one of the frames in Nagios. Um, yeah, so whichever of those solutions you choose or whether you write your own or something else, there's a number of issues that you'll need to be aware of and that you'll want to deal with. So let me come back to that first item there. Is Nagios the right tool for collecting your data? Um, so in some ways, you kind of don't want Nagios. So on one hand, it's, you can just use Nagios to collect your performance data because it's there anyway, right? It's doing your, your checks to see if things are up or not. And a lot of those plugins that are doing those checks also return performance data. So just since you're there, collect that performance data. You may as well, right? It's an argument to use Nagios. On the other hand, some of those plugins aren't very well written. Some of them don't return any performance data. And you actually have to parse their output to figure out what they're telling you to, part to figure that out. They're getting better, but um, that's still an issue. Some of them are, are also <coughs> poorly written in the sense that even if they fail, they, they some, some of them confound the state with the performance data, and that can be problematic. If your plugin just returns and says not okay, or it gives you a warning status but doesn't give you the performance data for that warning status, that's a problem. There are plugins out there that do that. They only give you the performance data if you're in an okay state. If you're in a warning or a critical state, or an unknown, well, unknown you couldn't really anyway, but they don't always give you the same performance data when you're in a warning or critical state. So the quality of the plugins is actually a factor in this and it will be a factor in your decision about whether you can use Nagios to collect your data. If you don't, uh, other issues have to do with the, the polling intervals. If your um, server, your Nagios server just can't poll frequently enough, sometimes five seconds isn't enough. Sometimes it's got to be every second and your Nagios server just may not be able to do that. So how often you need to collect the data matters as well. Um, and there's also the question of what do you do if Nagios can't connect to the machine that has the data on it? It's possible to have a machine be in a state where, you, where Nagios can't talk to it, yet it's still up and running, it's still viable, and it still is collecting data that you need. And if that's the case, you, you'll need something that does internal collection, performance collection and then periodic forwarding to Nagios, for example, to handle that kind of situation. So these can all be factors. Um, in deciding whether you use Nagios to do the performance trending. You can have redundancy. You could have Nagios doing it and Cacti doing it, for example. What you do depends on your situation. 
Um, another issue, um, you can do many combinations of those. The point of this is just to say, you can do it all in Nagios. You can do some in Nagios, some in Cacti. You can do completely separate. Um, like a lot of things in Nagios, there's a lot of ways to do it. So you could also say, well, I want to do this. I want to do it all in Nagios. Well, which one of the plug the add-ons should I use? Create a table, something like this. Okay. Um, put the things that matter to you down the left-hand side. Put your different plugins or add-on, sorry, add-ons across the top, and see how they perform against those features that matter to you. Okay. I can't create this generically. There's just too many different things to consider, and the ten that matter to you might be completely irrelevant to somebody else. So you've got to make your own list and see what actually matters. Um, back to the, the plugins themselves, there's this issue of performance data. Sometimes there, there is a standard defined for what the performance data should look like. When a plugin, if a plugin is going to return performance data, that's what it should look like. Name equal value, units, worn crit, that's what it's supposed to look like. And there are standards for what the units are supposed to look like. Once again, some plugins do that, some don't. So you need to check your plugins and see which ones actually do that and adhere to that standard. There's ways to work around it if they don't adhere to your st the standard, but it might mean you, you have to write some glue, you know, another wrapper around it, which can add some overhead, or it may mean you have to add a special uh, block in the, the map file in Nagios Graph, for example. And if you're doing that kind of thing, beware. Nagios 3.3.1 broke that behavior. Um, if a plugin doesn't return per performance data, Nagios doesn't even pass that information, any information on to the perf, the perf data file, which breaks a whole bunch of installations. So just beware of that. Um, the next issue has to do with uh, somewhat with data collection. So one of the systems uh, on this lighthouse that I work with um, in Maine, we have set up some power monitoring. To see. The intent is that within two years we want to get the thing completely off the grid. It's got a, this is an island about a mile offshore uh, in the mouth of Penobscot Bay. Right now we've got a power line coming out from the mainland for electricity, but the intent is to switch over to wind generated and solar uh, power. But to do that we've got to know how much electricity we're using now. So we've recently set up some power monitoring systems. And uh, it, it happens to be a TED 5000 system. It's kind of a low-end power monitoring system. This interface is actually written by, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Robert, Robert Tuflo Schneck is a guy who lives in Virginia because the stuff that comes with TED 5000 is rubbish. But this actually depends on Google charts. So this is a Google interface with Robert's software sitting behind it and a TED 5000 system generating the data from that and a Nagio system monitoring that. So when you start looking at the data here, when you first bring up the, the interface in Google Charts, it looks like this. You've got rather rough fragments. This, this section right here is actually detailed, but looking back in time further, it's pretty rough. It's doing some averaging there. If you sit there and wait long enough, it actually goes and fills in, and you see the actual data fill in in the back. Okay? The issue here is, when you're either when you're collecting data or when you're graphing data, you need to think about how much data you want to collect or see, right? If you want to just quickly look back in time, you don't want to see every little detail. You need to see averages to make some sense of it. Then you may want to zoom in or just zero in on a certain section to see the details that are causing the, the issues for you. Thing is, if you do that, so RD tool, um, <laughs> it does averaging automatically, which is good and bad. The problem with all this is you never know which data in the past you need to see until it's much too late to record it. So if you don't record it now, it, you're never going to be able to. So, um, and with our RD tool, some people's complaint with our RD tool is that it doesn't record every bit of data. Right? If you have a, that, that uh, other graph that I showed with the Google Charts, it actually records everything. 
find granularity, and the database keeps growing and growing and growing. So then you have to throw in something that prunes your database and does it in a smart way. Otherwise, the thing just eats up every bit of disk that you've got. Our D tool avoids that by having a detail. It has a couple of uh, archives set up. It has one that's very detailed that only goes back for about, well, you can define these, but typically goes back for like a week of high, or high uh, granularity data. And then the second one goes back for maybe six months with less granular data. And then the la last part of the archive, say, goes back for 10 years, but has everything averaged out. Okay? So that's how our D tool deals with it. It assumes that you want to only see detail within the last short period of time, and the further back in time you go, it's okay to have averages. If you've got more disk space, you can increase those buffers in RRD tool so that you can save more detailed information. And that's, that's how we work around it, that issue in RRD tool. But it's something you need to be aware of. How far back can you afford to save data? You need to establish that and put that into your RRD archive definitions when you set these systems up. Um, it comes into play when you're doing archaeology. When you're going back to troubleshoot, if you'll notice a lot of the RRD tool graphs you see, they end up starting looking chunky like that. Instead of like this one on the right where you've got nice little fine detail, as you go back in time you see these blocks. That's because of the averaging that's happening in our D tool. For some people that's not acceptable. You either have to crank up the resolution of RD RD archives or you need to find a different database system. It's also an issue in zooming. You can't just zoom in forever. At some point you reach the resolution and you can't see any more information. So beware of that as you're saving the data. But that leads to th this collection issue. How much data do you save and how often do you save it? Um, to start with, collect everything, <laughs> everything you possibly can. Until you get to know the system and what you need, collect everything. In time, you can go back and prune or you can adjust your schemas so that you don't save as much. But especially when you're just starting up a new installation, save everything um, and make sure you've got disk for it. But, um, save it often. and. Uh, at least if you use RD tool, you know that as you scale by new hosts and new service checks, it's going to scale by the number of hosts and service checks you do, not by how long you leave the system up and running. There's quite a bit involved in getting the round robin archive configurations right. There's this notion of a heartbeat, step size, and X files factor. These are the parameters that tell RD tool when it actually has valid information and when it should say, hey, I, I don't know what data there are, and it puts these and it, not a number values in there to say, I, I, I don't know what that is. So um, most of the glue tools, Nagios Graph, PMP for Nagios, they do these things automatically for you, but there are cases where you may have to go and tweak those. Maybe 90% of your servers are fine with a, a check every five minutes, but you've got 10 that have to be checked every minute. So you may have to adjust those parameters depending on how often you do the checks. Um, another thing people will talk about with RRD tool is the rigid, how rigid the schema is. That's true for any database. Uh, it's up to your glue level to really insulate you from that. Um, the reason that uh, a lot of people know that this is such an issue with RRD tool is because most of the glue layers between you and RRD tool are pretty thin. Um, for example, that thing with that, the Google chart that I showed earlier, that's got quite a bit of Java going on in between there, doing some processing between the end user and the database that sits behind it. Okay. So um, just to summarize a bit and then open up for some questions, there's quite a few free tools out there. There's some choice out there. There's even more that are um, not so free. My focus has been on the free ones. Um, I'm not really happy with any of them <laughs> right now, which is part of the reason I'm working on Nagios Graph, trying to make it better. Um, but even given that, uh, there's probably at least one of those that's gonna be good enough for you right now. And at least one of those is gonna provide some value to you right now, even if it doesn't do everything you possibly need it to do. Just being able to see the history is huge. It, it, if nothing else, it lets you sleep better at night, it just because you know the context. You know there's no gremlins out there, or you have a little better idea of where there might be gremlins. Um, and 
they continue to progress. PMP for Nagios is under active development. Uh, Nagios graph is. Um, you'll notice my commits tend to happen in the winter more than the summer, but that's just because of, yeah. Um, just for example, in 2009 when I started hacking on Nagios graph, it looked like that on the left, and now it looks like what you see on the right. A lot more features in there, cleaned up a lot. Just a little more about Nagios graph. Um, the first release was 2004. Um, the last release was in January. I have a bunch of changes that need to get released again. I was hoping to get that out before, well, it's coming real soon. Um, there's currently 18 project members in Source. This, it's all hosted on SourceForge. There's 18 on there right now. There's two of us who are actually doing any active development on it. Alan Brenner is the other um, recent committer on the project. About 70 to 100 downloads a day from SourceForge. I don't know where else it's mirrored. Um, uh, there are Debian and Debian and RPM packages if you prefer to go that way. And uh, one of the things that we've tried to do in the last year is to get code coverage in place. There was a lot of dead code sitting in there. So we've got 1,200 some unit tests that give us about 75% code coverage right now. So we're working to bring that up as high as we can, including all the CGI stuff. Um, and as you can see, there's getting close to double the unit test code as there is actual code. So those numbers make me happy. Um, this is a short list of some of the things we've got coming in Nagios Graph, and I hope to see coming in some of the other tools, but I, I don't know all their development plans. But uh, that's kind of the state of where things are right now um, from a Nagios Graph developer's perspective. Do you have any questions? Well, and what can you say about trend alerting? For example, we have a disk usage on the server, and uh, it has a trend of increasing well, one gigabyte a week. And afterwards, it increased five gigabytes a week. And we want to alert about it. Abnormal um, disk usage. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I guess my first reaction would be a lot of the plugins are, are written it's kind of like speed, velocity, and acceleration, right? Speed, and you do a, a derivative, you get your velocity, double derivative, you get your acceleration. So it's similar to that. You're, you're asking for not just when am I going to cross this threshold, your, your position. You're asking for the next level. What's the speed? How fast am I moving on that? So one option for that is to write a plugin that checks the data from the other plugins to see that kind of thing. Now. Yeah, um, that's, so I'm reflecting my pattern for doing things. That's where I would typically start. I'd throw together some simple little thing and see if it works. Is that actually what I'm trying to detect? So write a plugin that does that. It looks at the, at the, the trend, the, the, uh, the performance data from some other plugin. Is it doing what I think it should be doing? If it is, then I'll start, then I'll back off and say, okay, does that apply to just one host, multiple hosts, multiple checks? Make sure that scales across different situations. At that point, go step back and see if anybody else has done anything like it or has actually done it. Because by that point, you're going to know enough of the terms, how people refer to it. You can make better searches to find out what other people have done for it, and maybe somebody has. So could you speak to Nagios Graph uh, with Nagios XI versus Nagios Core? So Nagios Graph doesn't care which version of Nagios you stick it into. Um, if you use Nagios Graph in Nagios XI, you'll have to turn off the P PHP, P hmm, PNP for Nagios hooks that are in there, because they use the same hooks in Nagios. And Nagios doesn't allow you to have two different graphing two different anything, whether it's graphing or anything else, using those same hooks. It can only have one or the other. So you would just go into your Nagios config file, comment out the block that applies to PMP for Nagios, 
basically copy that block, but substitute the Nagios graph paths for the equivalents, and then it'll work. Um, can you comment about how many of the plugins in the Nagios core plugins package have the appropriate perf data to work? I don't even know how many there are. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, so when Nagios Graph was originally written, there was no perf data, or may maybe there was. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't around at that time. But so when Nagios Graph was, there's this map file that Nagios Graph uses that says, I don't care where it's coming from. I can take it from the output. I can take it from the perf data. I just look for patterns. I extract stuff from the patterns, and then I stuff it off into the into RD tool. So one of the things we've done in this past year is to reduce the amount of cu customization needed to do there. So if there are any that do adhere to the standards, it, this just works automatically. If it adheres to the standards, your data shows up. So that's one way to find out. Just run them, and anything that doesn't show up, it's got non-standard perf data. All right, well, let's give uh, Matt Wall a hand for presenting with us today.